let's uh, read our main text again, just from Matthew chapter 24. Okay, and we will, we will conclude this, uh, this uh, four weeks of studying on the subject of signpost. And we have put the nation of Israel at the center of this discussion. As Jesus left and was going out of the temple, his disciples came up and called his attention to its buildings. <clears throat> he replied to them, Do you see all these things? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be, held, will be left here on another that will not be thrown down. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of labor pains. Then they will hand you over to be persecuted and they will kill you. <laughs> I mean, that, what a prophecy huh? that uh, as, a, as a believer, you will be handed over. Then many uh, will fall away, betray one another, and hate one another. Now, this is because of the persecution. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. And you know, this is equivalent to backsliding based on uh, Revelation. Um, you have, you have lost your first love statement. <clears throat> but no one who endures to the end, but the ones who endures to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation is spoken, up, is spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man in, on the housetop must not come down to get things out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his coat. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Now this is one of those uh, things, you know, Paul says, because of, of the present crisis, it's better to stay as you are. I am convinced that uh, when this persecution against Christians um, goes in full swing, that will be a time also wherein marriage will not be wise because you get pregnant and there's persecution like this. Jesus himself said, Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your escape may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for at that time there will be great distress. The kind that hasn't taken place from the beginning of the world until now, and never will again, unless those days were cut short, no one would be saved, but those days uh, will be cut short because of the elect. Now, by the way, because of this passage, some people believe that the Holocaust was part of these times of tribulation, because there has never been a time in human history like the Holocaust. But we know that Jesus did not return yet, so it's not the Holocaust. So can you imagine it's going to be worse than that? The time of persecution will be worse than that. Unless those days were cut short, no one would be saved, but those days will be cut short because of the elect. If anyone tells you then, see, see here is the uh, Messiah or over there, or over here, do not believe it. False messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, possible, even the elect. Take note, I have told you in advance. So if they tell you he is in the wilderness, don't go out. Or see he is in the storerooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will gather. 
immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. By the way, this is why all of this, uh, remember the blood moon? They have, they have even published books because they were speculating, they said, but, but of course no other stars fell down, so they killed the news, you know. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, of course, we know that the, the, the double fulfillment promise, prophecy, as, as uh, they say it, was fulfilled. That generation had passed away, and the 70 AD came, and the temple was destroyed. You know. Now, concerning that day and an hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah uh, boarded the ark. In, in the Greek, it's, uh, it, it's in so many times, it's in the sense of, of uh, extreme multiplicity. We are living in those days because, because right now, some, some people think that uh, changing husband or wife is like changing shirt. I mean... We had a member before, by the way, yes, he, has, uh, he, had six, he had five wives. And I don't know he had uh, five husbands. And I don't know he had five husbands. So I was teaching one time, I, says, I said, can you imagine this uh, woman on, uh, on the well of Samaria? And I said, that's a lot. I, it's, she, came to me up, she came to me after the service, she's an American. And she said, you are right, uh, I had my five husbands. I, I was dumbfounded. I thought that's it. Until one day, one man came to me and said, I was teaching on right decision making and said, Pastor say you are right. He's a little older than me. He said, you're right. I finally learned my lesson. I said, why? He said, I had my six wives already. And so he decided to divorce the sixth wife and to get on and make the right decision on the seventh wife. You know? Can you imagine this, these people? If, if, to be honest, if we don't get it first, Maybe some people say, well, another chance. You know, but you don't get it the second time. I think you better quit. You, know? uh, you don't have what it takes to be a husband or a wife. Because th this, is, this thing is not uh, a multiplicity. But that will be common. And we know that today, the most promiscuous ones are the gays. And, are the gays. Uh, these, these are the days of Noah. Um, they, don't, they didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Can you imagine 100 years Noah was building the ark? Old man, why are you building the ark? Flood is coming. It, it goes in, it goes out. They, they realized there was a flood. You know, you know when they realized there was, there was a flood, right? No. When did they realize there was a flood? They were drowning already. This is what the Bible says. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. That means the waters have already risen and they were being swept. Oh, this is what Noah said. A hundred years of preaching. A hundred years. And you say, well, they, they died. No, the people in those days lived. And so when we talk about this generation will not pass until this happened, for the coming of the Son of Man, some will be hearing messages like this and they will not be listening. And it will sweep them away. And they will realize, oh, it's true. Now, remember, nobody here, nobody now lives 100 years. I mean, how many people do you know live lives 100 years? Almost nobody. That when somebody dies at 98, the world celebrates a long life. But in those days, 
they live for 700 years. And, and they, they saw this. 100, look, 100 years of preaching. Same Holy Spirit conviction. Didn't move them. You know, this is, this is uh, what you have to understand in terms of hardening of the hearts. That's why in the scriptures, there are times, and these are phenomenal passages when God says, enough, I will no longer listen to you. And the people will try to repent, and God says, no, I will not listen to you. I will not forgive you. And if you look only at that passage in the scriptures, it seems like, what kind of God is this? Well, you look at the background. When, when a person is a, is a habitual uh, rejecter of the message, that happens. Um, <clears throat> then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, taken and one left. That's why some people, 50% will be raptured. Two women will be grinding grain with a hand mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, be alert. Since you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this. If the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why you are also to be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Now, <clears throat> this you do not expect we have to understand it's relative. A lot of theologians actually believe when the trumpet is sounded, say you believe you're a pre-trib rapture believer, which I am. I'm a premillennialist and pre-trib. The Bible says the trumpet will be sounded. The time will, the day will not caught us unaware. So it seems like there is a trumpet call and we will hear it. And we will go up, up in the air. The context is Noah and the uh, pre-Deluvian people who refused to listen to the message of Noah. It caught them unaware. Whoa. But unaware not because they never heard. Unaware because it got here, went out there. And no faith was produced here. That's why those who will suffer in the tribulation has all been evangelized. You know. But it's still like the days of now they will think, I didn't know this will happen. No, you, know, you never believe. You know mentally it is going to happen. This is what we have been preaching. You know. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job. When he comes truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says in his heart, my master is delayed and starts to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That, that last parable is very powerful because this guy is a servant in the house. And it's not that he doesn't know his master is coming. He knows. He doesn't know the exact time, just like us. So he decided to just follow the inclination of his, of his heart. And the master came and the Bible says... He will, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, talk about the security. That's not here. You know? This is referring to the same household. Same household. You know? Same master. So we, we talk about that and, and we know how the disciples... They were warned about this, and yet, they did not understand. The cursing of the fig tree, the cleansing of the temple. They, these are all, and by the way, the picture of the living of the presence of the Lord. Jesus went to the temple, cleansed the temple, and then, and then he, he, he wept for Jerusalem, and the Bible says he left. And, and by its effect, the presence of the Lord left the temple. 
and, and pe people don't get it. And the presence of the Lord left the temple and the people don't know it. Why? They have religion. It is very much possible for a person to be so into religion, he doesn't know the difference between the presence of God and the absence of it. You know. Now, <clears throat> I, we, we uh, reviewed on the prophecies of Lester regarding America, and they all happened already. The only one last thing that uh, uh, we are not fully seeing but we are, we are uh, hearing and reading that it, is, it has begun. It's bestiality. You know. And uh, it's sex with animals. And I was saying this morning that from the first stories I heard, I was still in the Philippines, HIV virus was, was, came from this. Bestiality and idol worship in Africa, and part of the ritual is having sex with an animal, green monkeys. That's how, and from what I read, some Americans was exploring this. And, and by the way, when a person, and we know this from, from those who study sex, when a person becomes promiscuous, uh, the most satisfying sexual life becomes boring. And so they begin to experiment on the unnatural. And the, and the most unnatural will be homosexuality and bestiality. That's the most unnatural. Because so promiscuous I mean, you look at Will Chamberlain and Chamberlain and uh, Magic Johnson having sex partner six at a time. Why are they doing that? Because of, of sin, they lost, they lost the pleasure and the excitement. That's what happened. And that's what uh, is very dangerous. It's called the hardening of the hearts. We have seen that. The only thing is a full explosion of uh, bestiality. Now, I was still in the Philippines. I already heard this. There are, there are uh, dogs already trained uh, for sex. I mean, I, I, I heard some, I read and heard some of these stories. One time they saw a, a dog uh, and a woman was trying to have the dog drink from her breast. And so she was questioned. And she said, my, my dog is very uneasy, so I'm giving my dog comfort. Now, you, you hear these stories and you say, that's demon possession, guys. Okay, and, and that is the last thing that, that Lester said. And, and Lester said, the moment that happens is the last warning to America. Yeah, so it starts somewhere, you know. And uh, we, we uh, again, one of the devastation that we have today are uh, children with multiple parents and children with multiple siblings from the same mother or sometimes from the same father. It's, it's a very chaotic thing that is, that is going on right now. No wonder children are beginning to hate their parents. You know, because if you see your parents unfaithful, right there, you, in the Philippines we have a saying, the husband is the haligi uh, ng tahanan. You know what haligi is, right? It's the uh, English, the pier, the uh, the pillar, the pillar, yeah. And then the the wife is the uh, ilaw, the light of the family. So so two 
two items in the house that is most necessary to keep the house standing. And you demolish that. The most discouraged ones are the children. And it, it can bring us back to the Old Testament when the Bible really instructs the parents to raise up a godly household. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about uh, signs before the end. Okay. In Haggai uh, chapter 2, verse 15. Let me, let me just read back uh, Micah, Micah 3.12. I read this this morning, but let me, let me resume from there. Therefore, because of, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field, Jerusalem will become ruins, and the temples a mountain will be a high thicket. Okay. Now again, the southern kingdom witnessed the destruction of Shiloh. Shiloh was, was in Ephraim, just above Benjamin. And that is where the, uh, the tabernacle of Moses was planted when they entered the promised land. So that is, you may call, the original temple. Okay? And so here... You are looking at something that Moses supervised the building of. It lasted for hundreds of years. Okay? And so in terms of worship, in terms of false religion also, when something like that, it's a relic, you, you hold it dear and you want to preserve it. God allowed the thing to be destroyed. I mean, everything was destroyed. And so the southern kingdom was looking at that, but they have, they have, they have, uh, they have uh, how do you call this, uh, comforted themselves because now Solomon built a temple in Jerusalem. So they, they say, well, the center moved from Ephraim to Judah under the supervision of David. And God is saying, if you saw how Shiloh was destroyed, I'm going to destroy this building too. Look at the behavior of God. This is just a building. The important thing to me is relationship. This is just a building. This is just, look, that's the, the most magnificent edifice of that time, according to Josephus, including the temple that Herod built. It was so rich. The temple that Herod built, they say they put gold plates on the walls that they say when the sun rises, it looks like glass because because of the reflection of the sunlight. I mean, it was so rich that when Titus came to destroy it, they had to pull the, uh, the stone so they can extract the gold, you know. And, and God says, I'll destroy this too. I have a tremendous lesson for all of us. The most important thing to God is relationship, not material things. Because even if that is not destroyed, say, for example, it wasn't, when everything is burned up because of heat, that will still be destroyed, Okay. Great lesson for us in building a house. It's not our house. It's not our cars. It's the relationship between the uh, people. In the, we can always replace the house. We can always replace the car. But the relationships, no. Haggai, chapter 2, verse 15. Now, from this day on, think carefully. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple. From this day on. Now, remember in Haggai... It's the restoration of the temple. Haggai, Zechariah, Ezra. They first restored the temple. That's why they say that the temple appeared is a third temple. Now that was destroyed also. Again, great signpost, great lesson. God will allow it to be destroyed if the relationship is no longer there. But here Jesus gave us more details on chapter 24 on signs before the end. For example, in verses 3 2.8, you know, let me, let me read this again. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Just reply to them, Watch out, that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. They're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. 
all these events in the, at the beginning of labor pains. Now, can you imagine, first sign, uh, persecution, uh, wars, rumors of wars, and all of those things. And Jesus said an amazing thing. When, when you begin to hear these things, it, he says, you are, uh, you are not to be alarmed. Now, who will not be alarmed? The other translation is, it should not agitate you. Look, we hear of the war in Ukraine, and the world is agitated. Why is the world agitated? Grains coming from Ukraine turn out. It's one of the uh, uh, main exporters of grains throughout the world, especially in Africa. And so now there is partial famine going on because of the blockade in, in, the, in the Black Sea. Now that is just one war. Now we are, we are very concerned regarding the rumors of war in, in Taiwan. Because it will affect the Philippines. Considering we are not even in the Philippines. Now we are agitated because if war breaks out in Taiwan, uh, I don't believe the U.S. will support the Philippines. But the U.S. has to give a front or token resistance. You know what the token resistance means? It means hundreds of billions of dollars. Can, can you imagine uh, you have one rafter or one F-35 uh, sh shut down? You're talking about uh, uh, the, 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 the cheapest airplane from $25 million to $200 million. That's a lot of money to, uh, to just be shut down. And so now the taxpayers are going to pay for it. What happens? You will be agitated. But this is what you said. And this is the difference between believers and believers. Don't be alarmed. That means when we begin to hear of these things, if we are living, and this is, this is really where a person who lives by faith lives by faith. It should never agitate you. Now, that's almost an impossibility. It's very agitating. But if you live by faith, you know that God provides. If it easily agitates you, that means you don't see what's going on. You know? Have you heard statements, maybe you have, you have seen it in movies when somebody's in control. How come it doesn't face you what's happening? And it turned out he's the architect. He planned these things. And so if we have the mind of Christ, these things will be happening. We're saying, whoa, the Christian is, is feeling excited. Whoa, Jesus is coming back. But an unbeliever, alarmed, agitated, is a negative term. So persecution is foretold. Oh, the desecration of the temple. Now we already, now we have lessons from history already. The, uh, the tabernacle was desecrated. Uh, and you know, you, know, you know what happened when they were returning uh, the Ark of the Covenant, remember that? It was even placed on the foot of Dagon. That is sacrilege. It already happened. Okay? And then the Temple of Solomon. It was desecrated also. Can you imagine during the time, now, now the, re, the rebuilding, the interesting thing is the, the, the rebuilding of the temple, which some people call the second temple, Temple of Ezra, Antiochus Epiphanes. The guy literally offered pigs. Pigs, you know, on the temple. That will happen again. And they, des they desecrated the temple when Titus ransacked the temple. That's a desecration. And so if, now Israel is going to rebuild their temple. We have seen some of the articles of the temple already there. That's going to be desecrated. You, you have seen the gold items in the Temple Institute. All of that will be stolen. The Antichrist will, will, will raise his own image in the temple. And the Antichrist will ask to be worshipped. Now, people say, well, it's not going to happen. It will happen. It already happened at least three times. It's going to happen for the last time. Okay? And that desecration is the final thing on the times of the Gentiles. After that, the wrath of God will fall and the times of the Gentiles are over. 
So that kind of persecution. Okay, can you imagine children will go against their parents? You say, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Again, it's because we are reading and we are seeing things happen and we are not, we don't understand. Who told you it's not going to happen? Have you had in the Bible when parents begin to cook their children in times of famine? Yeah. What, for example, if, if uh, a sibling is told, hey, listen, why, why go hungry? It's because of your, the fanaticism of your siblings or your parents. Tell me where they are, and I'll give you food. These children will do it. It's primarily the backsliders. So, so now I'm saying this to you because, listen, guys, don't have any delusion regarding our families. Don't, don't have that. Because those who doesn't fear God will betray you. They will betray you. Oh, it's going to happen with Filipinos, especially Filipinos. I mean, it's not even persecution, but uh, we have, I have a relative, uh, an uncle of my father during the Japanese occupation, married his, his, how do you call that, the girl, niece, right? Married his niece, and they say, and this, this is not my family, father's side, married his niece, because the Japanese will rape a single woman. The niece was very young. I was told this when I was, when I was young. And said, rape, uh, marry this niece. And the Japanese wise up and begin to say, well, some of these are fake marriages. So they had that man have sex with his niece in front of the Japanese. And they did it. Just, they say, it's, it's better than being raped. Families do it to each other. By the way, if you, don't, if you don't believe that, have you heard of, uh, of uh, parents molesting their children? Uncles? In, in the Philippines, for example, they say the rape cases mostly happens within family. Uncles and fathers. So th don't, don't, don't tell yourself, no, it's gonna, not going to happen. It has been happening. So when, when a person tells me it's not going to happen, what, are you blind? That's why when Jesus begins to warn us of these things, these are not potentials. They already saw it happen. They ate their babies. They sell their wives. They sell their... Remember that, that uh, Levite and they want to have sex uh, with these angels? No, no. The, the one in... Was this Sodom and Gomorrah? Have... Have my virgin daughters. Do whatever you want. He was saying, the old man was saying, rape my daughters, they're virgins. Rape them. Let the whole town rape them. So when people today say, it's not going to happen, what, are you blind? I mean, are you, are you serious? Haven't you heard of history? Haven't you heard of even current events? It bothers me when, when a believer today choose to ignore this information that we have. Because the Bible even says, unless the days are shortened, nobody will survive. That's how bad. That's why we have to live. I, I told you the first church we have, uh, Korean church, remember the first church? The, the pastor went crazy. Because the wife went crazy. She, she's, she's, they are Koreans. She's a public school teacher in the South Side. The man was supposedly picking up her wife from teaching. And she was raped in front of the husband, Korea. Because they are Korean. And, and uh, the Korean wife, a pastor, the Korean husband, a pastor, she was, he was restrained, but he did not do anything. Now, she survived, and after she survived, one of the things that we're told is, sue the rapists. There were witnesses, and I think there are cameras. And the husband says, no, we forgive one another. 
But that's a pastor right there. The wife went crazy. And they say the, husband, the man, the Korean pastor, was never the same after that. You don't have to look far. It's happening even right now. And even in the news today, in New York, somebody was being raped in the subway station. Now, we're talking a few weeks ago. Have you heard, read of this? And the bystanders were watching. And they didn't do anything. Just, just walk through. I'm talking about New York subway. So guys, when you begin to say, it's not going to happen, we love one another. Guys, don't be more than foolish. It has happened. It's happening today. They took a picture downtown Chicago. Uh, somebody, a businessman says, I'm moving my business to, uh, to where? To Florida. Somebody broke down the establishment's window and began to steal from this business owner. And she's, it's caught on camera, it's on YouTube. Help. People were just watching. They don't care. So when, <laughs> when we say it's not going to happen, whoa. Are you even serious? Are you, are you awake? These things can happen. Yeah. And, and Jesus warned us of these things. Oh, false Christ and false Christ. There are tons of them. Again, when I was teaching in the Bible school in the Philippines, there were at least four Filipinos during that time that claimed to be Jesus. Right now we have another one. He's still alive, Kibuloi. The, the guy claimed that he is the appointed Son of, son, of, son of God right now. Can you imagine a, a Filipino and, and very influential to, to claim he has 6 million followers worldwide and uh, supported Duterte and, and Bongbong Marcos. And he has, he, has, he has political power right now. And we are seeing that and so when people say, is that going to happen? Whoa, open your, it's happening. It's right for our eyes. But all of these things will happen because the, the, the Antichrist, the Satan knows, the serpent knows, his time is short. When you begin to see the escalation and, and, and like how things are, are being rushed today, you know the time is short. Th think about this. Think about this. Bill Clinton realized the time of big government is over. So he backed off. They have the majority. And then in the midterm election, the Republicans took over and Newt Gingrich became the Speaker of the House. First time that we have a balanced budget. First time. Bill Clinton is a progressive, but he backed off because he is, he is center, center left. You know? uh, progressive, I think he's just saying it to be, to be acceptable. But, but he backed off. During the Obama administration, the progressive gained traction. Now, if, if you are thinking straight, you're saying, well, we gained some grounds. We did not come out uh, negative. So you would wait and say, now we have people placed in, in Washington, in the Capitol, in the Supreme Court. We have these people in place now. I will, I will pause. We have a Republican president, that is Trump, uh, let's, let's just pause. It's anyway, it's between four to eight years only. After that, let's, let's resume. We have people in power, they have no patience. Like they are rushing things. I mean, are we watching the same news? They are rushing things. You know, when they are rushing things like this, you begin, you, you begin to say, well, you know, no, no, it's the devil. He is rushing things because his time is short. And, and I look at this, believe me, there is an excitement inside. Whoa. Jesus could come back any time. But others are looking at it like, well, just, that's just politics. No, the, the, en the enemy right now is rushing things.
things because he's got his, his days are numbered. Jesus is about to return. Now, the conclusion here is in verses 32 36 of Matthew 24. <clears throat> Take heed or watch. When you say watch, it doesn't mean just watch the television and watch. Watch has, has, has the idea of get yourself prepared, protect yourself. You know, get yourself situated so that you're in a position to endure, you're in a position to overcome. You know, it's just like, it's just like we know, I, I know that the government will push having, have, uh, will push to tax even church properties. And, and I know that things are going up. And I was thinking, boy, we've got to be free from this. If they tax church properties, we've got, we've got several lots. That's a lot of money. So I, I said, we, you're watching this. Take heed. Let's pay the mortgage. Because the moment the mortgage is clear, then if they impose this, we can handle it. I mean, we will not even be alarmed. You see? But you make the preparations. But the amazing thing is when you are giving warnings to people and they are not taking heed. They, it's just like, okay. But this is what we are told, you know. Now, the, the parable of the fig tree in verse 32 to 36. New Testament interpreters, is especially the premillennialists, the, the premillenarians, as they call them, and the pre-tribulation uh, uh, people, they are always trying to guess the time of his coming. Now we are so caught with the when. The when is never something that we should major on. What we should major on is the preaching of the gospel. Because the when you don't know, only the Father knows. Don't even believe when people say, you know how many thousands of Christians really believe that Jesus is returning? And, and, and DJ, I think, was the one who was reminding me. Not too long ago, there was another one wherein they say Jesus is coming back. And people got caught up in it. And Jesus said, don't even, don't even pay attention to it because it's not, it's not true. Now, when I say pre-millennialist, pre this is Jesus returning before the millennial reign. And he will reign the millennial reign. pre trib means there will be a rapture uh, before the great tribulation takes place. And uh, the great tribulation is seven years. But the heated one is the last three and a half years. Now, some people say the rapture will take place in the middle of the great tribulation because that's where the heat is really going to turn on. I don't know. Okay, because personally, I don't want to see the Antichrist. Uh, I, I think if there are Christians during that time, especially Pentecostals and Charismatics, to try to, they, and they identify as the Antichrist, they'll try to cast the devil out of that person. And, and this Antichrist will be given power over the faithfuls. When I say given power, that means God will allow them to kill these believers. Uh, that's why... He who endures to the end will be saved. That, is, that statement is made because of that. But not everybody believes in the rapture. Some very famous leaders today don't believe in that. Uh, John Ruzas Rashduni uh, wrote the book on the natural law. He basically discipled a very famous evangelical on that subject, that's Pat Robertson. <laughs> Pat Robertson don't believe in the rapture, okay? In, in fact, when I was still at Regent, he believed that we were already in the middle of uh, the Great Tribulation, on the trumpet judgment, I'm sorry, in the middle of the trumpet judgment. Well, that was, that was in the 90s, and Jesus has not returned yet. But Pat Robertson, I admire the guy, obviously, because I graduated from his school, uh, plus, of course, we have a student here that, that, uh, that is sitting beside her mom. So. But Pat Robertson don't believe in the rapture. <laughs> what he believes is 
the Christians will take over politics. That's why the Republicans are pushing for the Republican majority and take over the House and the Senate and the, and the presidency. It's because of the, uh, of the kingdom, the dominion theology influence. They believe that the world is gonna, uh, we, will ha we will have Christian cows producing Christian milk and Christian cheese. We will have schools being taught by Christian teachers. And that is not new, that's why the General Alexander David, Zion City is built. There's a new one, he's denying it, but boy, he's doing it. <laughs> you know, here in Indiana, who's this guy? Very famous, Hammond, uh, Mark Hammond, Indiana, part of the faith movement. A few years ago, he just bought and he shocked <laughs> some, you can tell he shocked some uh, faith movement leaders. He announced in the, in the minister's conference, he said, he said, you know, he said, I'm just saying this, but I bought acres of land, he said, in, in uh, I don't know if he lives in Minnesota or India, I think Minnesota. I, I, I bought acres of land, he said, and we're having a Christian school and just in case difficulties happen, we have, we have livestock there and people will be fed. He is, he is building it. Yeah? While denying it, he's building it. Juan Carlos Ortiz, one of the associates, is dead now, one of the associates of Robert Schiller in, in, in uh, I think, Argentina, he tried to build it. Yeah. And, and failed. It's because of the effect of Dominion theology. They, they believe the Republicans are really under this. They believe that if we can legislate righteous laws, we can make the world better. And when the world gets better, it will prepare for the second coming of Christ. So Jesus will just come and reign. Well, what's the use of him coming? We already get it done, you know. Uh, opposite of what the Bible says, that Jesus will come and, and bring peace and order to this darkened world. But there's a lot of Christians today who doesn't believe in the rapture anymore, nor uh, in the millennial reign. There's really not going to be a millennial reign. The world is just going to keep getting better and better and better and better until it facilitates the return of the Lord. But the Bible says that wickedness will increase. You know, so, so very opposite. Now it is noticeable also that Jesus rejects the setting of the dates and uh, end times of the end of times. Only the Father knows. What does this mean? Jesus taught us that his second coming is imminent. That from the time he left, that is, that is in around 32, 33 AD, from the time he left to date until he returns, every Christian in each generation should be on the lookout, on the watch. We should, this is a famous saying, we should plan as if he's not coming back again. But we should live as if he's coming back today. Okay? Our problem is we plan as if he's coming back today. But we live as if he's not coming back at all. I mean, you look at Christians, how they live. It's like the, the parable of that uh, unwise servant. As if the master is not coming. So they keep doing whatever they, they, they want to do. You know, I'll just do whatever I want to do. But you ask them, what are your plans? They have no plans. Because they plan like Jesus coming back today. But they lived like he's not coming back at all. It's the exact opposite of what uh, that uh, dictum is telling us. So in fact, those who guess the time end up encouraging estimation as to how much time does we have, do we have left. I mean, if we know Jesus is coming back in 2024, some people will live like the devil until 2023 and then repent just before. Can you imagine if September 25, this was September 22, I think 1985 is when Jesus is coming back. I will spend all of my money and on September 22, repent. And... Uh, and go to heaven. But it's not, 
It's not going to happen. The suddenness of the event is what we are taught. If something suddenly is happening, for, for example, NATO, because of Ukraine, NATO relaxed. They're not really giving their budget on the defense because, because uh, they won the, we, we won the Second World War and Russia was not really doing anything. When the Iron Curtain collapsed, the Cold War was over. When the Cold War was over, they dropped the guard. And then suddenly, <laughs> Trump came and said, hey, give your, your uh, what's that, 2% of your GDP. And he demanded, and it turned out, the richest nations like, like uh, France and Germany were not giving their contribution. Why? Because Russia is no threat until Ukraine. Well, it started with Georgia. Now they are marshalling everybody. You see? When, when you are not on, on the watch that it may happen any time, you relax. That's the only word I have, relax. You, you, and sometimes we do relax. We believe that, that we have a lot. Some of us are very convinced we have a lot of time to repent. Don't, don't do that. Some people really believe they have plenty of time. God can call, God can call me tonight. And I would love to, see, to leave and see my grandchildren because my, uh, my two boys are too slow, you know. Referring to Joseph and John, just just super slow. <laughs> so I, I said, I wanna I wanna live to see my grandchildren. I am very aware, though, that Jesus can call me home tonight. You think Jesus talks to me tonight and say, "Say I'm ready to take you home." You think I'm gonna say no? I'm gone. I'm living. It's just. There's just nothing that will hold me here. I mean, my expectation is to see Jesus. Nothing can compete with that. Not even a DJ, you know. Nothing, nothing can compete with that. Jesus tells me tonight, hey, I miss you, you know. <laughs> go home. Let's go. You see. Nobody can brag about tomorrow. But I know you're with me on this one. A lot of people live like they have plenty of time that they can snatch it on the last minute. That's the attitude of a fool. Yeah. We should live as if he's coming back today. So, because of that, can I delay serving God and living for him? This is never the point of eschatology. Yeah. Never the point of eschatology. This is not the stock market. Hold, hold it, hold it. Don't, don't invest. Don't, don't invest. It will still, it will, it, it will still go down. Don't, don't, don't buy. Don't buy. It was, no, it's not the stock market. You see, because the point of eschatology is serve him now, not tomorrow, not one hour later, but serve him now. If we don't have that urgency to serve him and to live for him, if we don't have that attitude, then we missed it. If any of you here right now has an attitude, well, you have plenty of time. You missed it already. You're not going to miss it. You missed it already. That is not the point of eschatology. The suddenness of the event is what we are taught. It can happen anytime. And it's imminent and it's inevitable. What is most important for believers is constant preparation for the suddenness of his coming. You know, I, uh, every time I do international travel now, I carry a very light uh, backpack, simply because it's heavy. I cannot, I have DJ bring my computer, you know. But I always put one change of clothes in my backpack. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, for example? If my, how do you call this? If my uh, luggage, like what happened to me in Israel, if my luggage is lost, you know. So I always, and I like to take a shower in Asia before two hours later going to the Philippines. Because you don't know what will happen when you lie in the Philippines. Uh, like, 
like this time, the moment I land in the Philippines, I have my first appointment already. You know, uh, that whole afternoon I have I have a schedule already. That's after I land. I told them 3 p.m., but they moved me to 12. I'm arriving 11:40. <laughs> but I said, why did you put it at 12? We'll we'll wait, you know. But <laughs> but uh, I said 3 said until it's done. So I I, I I don't have time to go home uh, and then take a shower. What, what I'm saying is you have to be ready. If we are espousing any thought, I will have plenty of time now. I hope you guys will understand this. You have no time for your kids. You can't wait on your kids. You, you've got to use all your influence. Serve him now. You know, you know when, I, when I'm saying any of my kids backslide, I'm removing them from my will. I am not joking at all. I have no time to play garbage with any of my kids. You can come back now. Yeah. I, I have that urgency. He can return now. If you are playing, saying we have plenty of time, you have been deceived already. Because the point of this teaching on the second coming of the Lord is the imminence and the inevitability. And we don't know. That's why we have to always be prepared. The coming of the Lord is very decisive from which there is no turning back. You know. When the trumpet is sounded, you can't say, oh, perhaps, wait, 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 I, I forgot my Louis Vuitton, you know. I'm bringing it with me. No, there, there is none. Oh, well, wait, I, I, I forgot to witness to my mom or to my dad. I'm waiting for that. There's none. We, the second coming of the Lord is pushing us in a corner to be decisive. So there is no turning back. You can't be, the Lord returns and say in the rapture, you can't be in the middle of the air and say, whoops. Remember the parable of Lazarus and the rich man? The rich man says, let me warn my brothers. Abraham is too late. Too late. They have the prophets. Never listen. Very decisive. Second coming doctrine. We should also be decisive in how we should live. We cannot be lukewarm. It is the imminence of the end that, de that, that demands decisive measures. Because it's imminent. It can happen anytime. We cannot play around can't play around. God determines the future. People live according to the present. That's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, we, we are told in the Bible to live for today. God determines the future, but today is, is, the, is the word. Today, serve Him. Today. It's all, every, time, every time you wake up, today you must serve Him. Today you must do everything for God. Today you must give it all for God. Every day is like that. What about the future? God takes care of that. In fact, he said, don't worry about tomorrow. Just today. There's already enough problems for today. You know? Well, what if my kids hate me? That's tomorrow. Yeah. I, I discipline my kids. What if, if, if they, actually my wife is the one who's trying to put a break on me. What if they hate you tomorrow? That's tomorrow. Don't say about today. So I'll discipline them today. What about tomorrow if they hate you? Let them hate me tomorrow, but I'm not concerned about that. It's today. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we should be foolish, but we are told to live for today. Any passage concerning the end time never portrays God also as a desperate king. He is sovereign and is always in control. He's not alarmed, even if, if, it, even if it doesn't seem like it. That's why I like the passage in, in uh, Psalm chapter 2, when the enemy raised their fist against God, God laughed. Yeah, God laughed. Uh, so, now let's, let's talk about taking heed. In, in verse 33, Watch, be alert, for you don't know when the time is coming. It is like a man on a journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, gave each one his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to be alert. Therefore, be alert, 
Since you don't know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or at the crowing of the rooster or early in the morning. Otherwise, when he comes, suddenly he might find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to everyone, be alert. Ignorance of the, in, in theology we call it the parousia, or the second coming, or the appearance. Ignorance of the second coming of the Lord is not an excuse for being unprepared. Okay, it's not an excuse. Instead, ignorance on when he is coming back is the reason for vigilance. Well, you, you cannot say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, I don't know that you're coming back. I'm, I never started this. That's not an excuse. Because ignorance actually is the reason why we should be vigilant. Okay? By, by the way, when you left your houses this morning, did you guys lock your doors? Did you? Why did you? John is wondering, did I lock the door, you know? <laughs> because one time James went to the, to the house where he's sleeping, and the door is not only unlocked, it's open. Like, like John is welcoming the thieves. Come in, you know? <laughs> uh, but, but did you lock your doors? Why did you lock it? Because you don't know when the thief is coming. Can thief, I'm, I'm, you don't say I'm born again. Hey, listen, born again people have been robbed. Okay? So you, you buy, do you, do you guys have a smoke alarm in your house? It's the law. All right. Did you ever have fire? We have a smoke alarm, we turn it off. Because, you know, in my house we have, we have two powerful exhaust fans. And my wife insists this would be buy it's the best. She doesn't turn it on. <laughs> and so every time she cooks, the smoke just so, and, and when I pay her money, you know. When, when you are ignorant that, that the thief can come anytime, you are vigilant. You know, you are vigilant. Uh, I, I told my kids I have done that with, with Joseph, and Joseph brought John. I brought DJ, and the only person in my house now who have not handled a gun is Joel. Yeah. But even James knows how to shoot. Yeah. Why? You don't know. What if a thief comes and you say, Papa, can you teach me how to shoot? <laughs> Too late. You know? Well, pastor said, are, are you ever going to use it? I hope not. I hope not. But, you know, I was thinking, I don't want to be like that pastor whose wife was raped in front of him. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be like that. You know. Uh, you don't know when. So actually ignorance becomes a call to vigilance. In verse 37, it gives us the summary of the whole passage and Luke has the version. Be on your guard so that your minds are not dulled from carousing, drunkenness, and worries of life. For that day will come on you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come on all who live on the face of the whole earth. Now this tells us why we stop being vigilant. Simple passage in, in Luke 21-34. If you say, well, I'm not vigilant, I'll tell you the reason why. The Bible says this. Number one, because we can be dulled Okay, uh, in, I like the Tagalog uh, term for this. Mapulpul ka na. Yeah, mapupulpul ka. Meaning like, like an, an axe, uh, you, it will be dull, it will have no sharp, sharpness in it. 
You know what dulls a man, a believer? Carousing and drunkenness. Or loose living in other translation. The moment you engage yourself in immorality or loose life, carousing, drunkenness, you are dull. It, it dulls you. It takes away sharpness. That's why you will find that in the uh, entertainment industry, it dulls our moral sensitivity because of the permissiveness that it promotes. Because the moment, the moment you got into this, boil you're down. You lose the vigilance. You, you, you just... You just lose it. You know. My my father pride himself. You know, some people they drink a little bit of alcohol alcohol, they cannot they cannot take it in. They they vomit, they go dizzy. They don't have what it takes to, to take it in, you know. My father prided himself in being a professional drunkard. Yeah. Until one day, and he's in control, he can take a jeep, he doesn't drive. He can walk, he can find his way home. But one day he was so drunk, and I was there, I was almost always I accompanied him. And the house where he was drinking is the house of my aunt, and it has two floors, renting it. We were on the top floor. And you know how houses are in the Philippines. The, the staircase is so steep. And he was, he was so drunk. I don't know, it's how many, second floor. And no safety in the Philippines. There were rocks on the bottom. And there was, I was a little boy. And we were going down. And he stumbled and he fell from the top. Down. Now that is, that is a big problem because I was behind him. The fellow drunkard says, Oh, Jose pushed his dad. I was a little boy, I was shocked because I pushed my, my I know I did not push my father, but I was, I was worried now because my father always beat me. I was saying, man, my father <laughs> recovers from hangover, I'm dead. <laughs> I mean, his eyes was all busted. He, he was as ugly as it can be. I mean, he was blood, blood all over. And when he was, I saw him rolling down and I was watching. I'm not about to follow him. You know, I, I don't want to fall like that. But the whole time I was assisting my father, a fellow drunkard was saying, Jose pushed his father. <laughs> and I was assisting my father nervous. What if he recovers? You know. But I think my, my father is in absence. We never talk about it. He walked up the following morning with a swollen face, bleeding. And he just looked at me. Maybe he got scared of me that I pushed him. You know? <laughs> Maybe I'll push him again. But I was, I was a nervous wreck. Because I was thinking, man, my father wakes up and I'll, I'll tell you, I wish when he slept that night, blooded, that the, that the night will never end. I was so nervous because he, he beat me so many times, beat me up so many times. I was nervous. But he over relaxed. He think he can keep drinking and he keep drinking. But after that, he became careful. Because he already fell. You see? When, 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 when we use ignorance, well, I don't know. Pastor said, I don't know it was wrong. Ignorance is never an excuse. Ignorance in the Bible is actually a call to vigilance. We say, I don't know. That is not the reason to sin. That is a reason not to sin. You see the exact opposite? Now, we are using ignorance as an excuse. Oh, he doesn't know. Well, right? Because he doesn't know better. Okay, there is a liquid here. This is your drink, right? There's a liquid here. Somebody opened it. Everybody saw it. Drop something. And DJ was about to drink it. Whoa, so somebody dropped something there. Is it poison? Is it urine? What is it? I don't know. So do you drink it because you're ignorant? No, you become vigilant and you don't drink it. What the false 
teachings is teaching right now is because you are ignorant, you drink it. No, the Bible specifically said it's because you don't know, then live right. By the way, is it right for me to date him or to date her? You're ignorant, right? I don't know if it's right. The answer is this, be vigilant, don't. Because you don't know. Well, I dated him because I don't know. The exact opposite. You don't know, that's why don't. You see, that's the difference now. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know if, if this party will, will, will end bad or end, end good. But you know, they're my friends. I'd rather go. No, because you're ignorant, don't go. You see how the different reaction that we have is? It's the brainwashing that takes place. And, and uh, verse 37 gives us also the reason, the summary of the whole passage. Look at this version. Uh, ag again, do not get dulled on this one. Uh, and the other one is worries of life. You know what, what, what uh, makes us not sharp? We are worried about life. <laughs> yeah. I, I told my wife, you know, I, let's just sell the houses that we have. Well, you know, Elizabeth gave me the house so when I'm old, my kids can watch over us on that house. How do you even know that my kids would love? I mean, Joseph is now thinking of staying in Ohio, maybe buying a house in Ohio. That, that guy, you know. He's already a college graduate. Joseph, if you are watching, you know. <laughs> uh, but I tell my wife, why, why are you planning for our children's future. We can only prepare them for their future. We cannot plan for them. Yeah. We can only, there's a big difference. We can only prepare them. I can prepare my kids. Giving them teaching, I can't plan for that. I don't know what tomorrow brings. I can't plan for that. I can't say, on this year you will get married. I can't do that. I wish Joseph is married now, but the, I never realized that boy is too fast to eat. He's too slow to get married. You know? <laughs> I mean, Joseph is watching, you better listen. Yeah. yeah. No, can I plan for that? No, I cannot. If Joseph is enjoying his life, serving the Lord, I cannot. He better enjoy his life. I'm all for it. I'm 100% supportive uh, about it. I can't, I can't plan for it, but I can prepare him for it. Hey, Joseph, make sure you pay your tithes. You respect your mom, you know. I said, I can deal with you not respecting me because I'll just hit you. Uh, that's why I tell my kids, you know, if you disrespect me, it's okay. You'll just have to handle me. But I, I tell them, don't, don't do that with my wife. Uh, because, you know, Anne is small, literally, you know. Uh, so I said, don't, don't do that to your mom. Don't break your heart. You want to break somebody's heart? Break my heart. You know, if, if John wants to break my heart, go for it, boy. You know, uh, so see what happened. I can do something about it. But you see, I can prepare them for that future. I cannot plan for that. I can't. What we are doing is we are trying to plan for that. And we ignore preparing them for that. I'm going to save a million dollars for my child. Yeah, but are, is the child prepared to handle a million dollars? He will just lose it. We did not prepare them. Okay, son, at this age you should get married. You planned for that, but did you prepare him? Did you tell him that that beautiful wife will one day get ugly? And she may get fat. You know, and she may lose the attractiveness. Because beauty, the Bible guaranteed, fades. If you think your beauty will stay with you, read your Bible again. It fades. Okay, so the Bible says enjoy the wife of your youth, not enjoy the wife of old age. No, how can you enjoy when you're old? You know, you see, you're quiet now. Yeah. So, but this worries us. If you are too worried about your future, if you're too worried about, you're too worried about your, if you're too worried about your retirement. 
You know, I'm not even worried about my retirement. My wife is more worried about that. I'm not. If you're worried about that, it will dull you. So what do people do? They prepare. Now, there's nothing wrong with preparing for that. You should if you can, like if you're poor or one day or something like that. But you're, you're, you're so worried about that, you want to have the stocks in line, so you're just making money, that you never prepare for that. So what did people do? They abuse themselves. They plan for that. I'll put this much. They plan and plan, but they're not prepared. They abuse their body. They get sick. They work until they are, what, 65 or 72. One year after they retire, their retirement, they die. What's the use of working from you are 15 years old to your 72? You know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars you have saved for that? And you only spent 1,000. You only draw one year of your retirement money. Because you plan for it, you did not prepare for it. And the emphasis of God is prepare for it. Live for today. It can come any time. And anything that can make you dull in your understanding of the times, get rid of it. You know? my, 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 my wife still don't get it. I can sell those houses today. And my wife says, what about the tax? I'm not even concerned about that. I'm, I'm, I'm really not. I don't know why I'm not, but I'm just not. You know? You, you make preparations like that, and then God can call me one night and say, it's time to go home. And I'm not prepared for it because I have not served him. You know? Uh, the, the signs are here in front of us. Oh, God. We have to open our eyes. It's happening right in front of our eyes. When, when will we ever recognize it? We have to stay sharp. If you're going to be, if you're gonna be a, a good guard, be on your guard. You've got to stay sharp. <laughs> yeah, you have to. That, that shooter in the church uh, and, and uh, one leader just took an aim hit him in, in the head, one shot, died right away. Well, it just so happened that the guy is prepared. Did he plan that, that uh, rampage? No, but he's prepared. He is an instructor in arms. And so he knows how to draw quickly, knows how to, to aim, and so it's just muscle memory. Somebody shoot, he saw the guy, boom, hit in the head. The other guy is not prepared for it. He got nervous. And he could have shot him first, but he did not. Because he is planning for it, but he's not prepared for it. Most of us console ourselves because we are planning. <laughs> are we prepared? Are we prepared? Look, right now I'm in the States. I'm training a lot of leaders. Not only did I plan, well, I, I planned less on that one, but I'm prepared for it. God prepared me through the years. I'm prepared for it. So when opportunities come, I can train them because I'm prepared for it. Some people keep planning. I'll do this, but you never prepare. Never prepare. So what happens? The opportunity comes, you're not prepared. Preparedness is what we are told to have. Future, God holds it. God holds it. So live for God, right now, not tomorrow, right now, and be well with yourself. Amen? Okay, let's go on the ashes. Hallelujah.